Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and today I have with me Kristen Fuoco with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. Kristen is a wildlife biologist, and she's going to be telling us about the golden-winged warbler. So I'm Kristen, and I work for the Indiana University of Pennsylvania Research Institute in partnership with Virginia NRCS to promote the Golden Wing Warbler Initiative, which is part of Working Lands for Wildlife. So Working Lands for Wildlife is a program created in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NRCS to promote wildlife conservation and habitat conservation on private lands. Across the nation, they have a couple different initiatives and focal species from gopher tortoise to eastern hellbender, sage grouse, and the Golden Wing Warbler. So the golden winged warbler is a neotropical migrant, meaning it spends its summers here in the Appalachian regions as well as the Great Lakes. And then in the fall months, so starting about this time of year in August, uh, they'll start heading back down to Central and South America, uh, places like Colombia and Venezuela, where they'll spend their winter there before migrating back up north in late April, early May to breed here. Um, they are an insectivorous bird, meaning they only eat insects. Their main diet consists of leaf rolling caterpillars. So if you ever find a leaf that's rolled up really tight, if you open it up, you might find a caterpillar inside. And the bird is specialized to actually extract these caterpillars from the leaves. Um, they have a very strong beak that can open up those leaves and pull out a caterpillar. They're also a ground nesting species. So unlike many birds you might be thinking of that nest high up in trees, uh, they prefer to nest on the ground. So they're a ground nesting species and what they typically look for is a strong sturdy stem to attach their nest to. Uh, one of their favorite species is blackberry and raspberry. Um, so what they'll do is they'll come in underneath here, find the stem of the plant and just kind of build a little cup nest right on the ground using these stems as support. Uh, sometimes they'll even use old goldenrod stems that are dyed and still standing or they'll use sapling stems. And then their nests are made of grasses and lined with big grape bark pieces. So uh, think of a big grape bark vine hanging off a tree. They'll go and collect that bark and use it to line their nest. So what we're standing in is approaching prime golden wing warbler nesting habitat. Uh, they look for a mosaic of shrubs, saplings, and grasses, um, really young forest or overgrown fields. So this is where they'll choose to nest and defend their territories and raise their kids. Um, but if we were to zoom out from this stand into the broader landscape, you would see that it's heavily forested. So we know the bird prefers these young forest stands to nest in, in a greater forested landscape. So this is their nesting habitat where they'll spend their summers. Um, they do prefer more high elevation sites. So for example, here we're at about 2000 feet. This is um, the beginning of their range. They'll go up to about 4,000 feet in elevation. Uh, after they're done nesting here, they'll head back down to Central and South America, cross the Gulf Coast in one day, which is pretty impressive for a bird that's about the size of my palm and weighs as much as two nickels. So the reason the golden wing warbler is a focal species for working lands for wildlife is because it's experiencing prolonged population declines across its entire breeding range. Since the 1960s, we know the golden wing population here in Virginia has declined at an average of 6% per year. There's a couple different reasons that we know this is happening. Uh, the first being hybridization. So there's another bird, the blue winged warbler, which is nearly genetically identical to the golden wing warbler. The two species do hybridize in areas of overlap and produce fertile offspring as well that continue to hybridize. Another reason they're declining is loss of non-breeding grounds habitat. So deforestation practices happening in Central and South America um, are causing some amount of their decline. But the main one I'm going to focus on today is loss of breeding habitat. Um, so this young forest, the shrubland habitat, um, we just don't see it as much as we used to. Historically, this type of habitat was created by natural disturbances such as wildfire or even things like beavers that would uh, create these shrub wetland meadows. Another reason we see loss of this type of habitat is because our forests in the eastern United States are largely the same age class. Uh, most of the forest is between 80 to 100 years old in the eastern United States. That's due to uh, historic practices in logging and at the same time farm abandonment. So what happened was in the early 1900s we had these 
fields that were created either from timber harvesting or from farms that were later abandoned and they were left to grow uh, for the past 100 years. So now we have forests that are all the same age class, um, very little young forest in the landscape. And so that really hurts the golden wing warbler that needs the shrubby, young, dense habitat. But it also hurts species um, like woodcock and rough grouse, wild turkey, uh, tons of other songbirds and warblers. So it's very important to preserve this type of habitat for those species. So in Virginia, 80% of forest land is privately owned. So we know that we need this young forest habitat. So it's important for us to create this type of habitat on private property. So the Golden Wing Warbler program incentivizes landowners to create, maintain, or enhance young forest habitat on their properties. In Virginia, this project area covers 29 counties from Western and Southwest Virginia. Uh, in this example, we are on a piece of private property that is bordered by the Washington National Forest. Um, so this is a great opportunity to help break open uh, kind of the sea of sameness of the National Forest, a really heavily forested, mature forest um, with this nice little piece of young forest tucked into it. So for our projects, many places have different starting points. Sometimes we're starting with something like this, where we had a mature forest stand that was ready to be harvested. Uh, so we did that to create shrubland habitat. Sometimes we're working with an old field that has been left to grow for a long time and is just kind of covered in shrub. Um, there's not really that mosaic of herbaceous species versus woody species. It's all kind of overgrown. Uh, sometimes we're working with a field that was recently cleared and wants the landowner wants to do some planting in it to help promote wildlife habitat. We can help with all of those situations. Uh, this specific one, as I said, was a large forest stand that was cut to become young forest. Um, our harvest prescription does require us to leave 10 to 15 trees per acre. Uh, the ideal species we're looking to leave are oaks and hickories, primarily white oak, because we know white oak is highly beneficial for wildlife, both as a food resource um, and for regenerating the future hardwood stands. We also like to leave several snags per acre. So um, these are standing dead trees that things like woodpeckers and owls roost in, as well as other species of wildlife like flying squirrels, raccoons, and things like that. One of the risks you take with a partial harvest is that it opens up the stand to increase damage from winds. And so this stand, we did the partial harvest in and that had a lot of wildlife benefits, a lot of benefits for regeneration. But you can see that there was some kind of a storm here uh, over the summer and it has caused a lot of wind damage and wind throw in this stand. So a lot of good reasons to do a well-designed partial harvest, but always that risk also um, in the short term after a partial harvest. So after harvest, there's gonna be a lot of species that try to come back and reestablish. Uh, for example, you'll see a lot of tulip poplar. It's a very fast growing species that really thrives in sunlight. Another one you'll see pretty common is red maple. Both species are really fast growing, really like when you open up the canopy. But underneath that, what you're still gonna find is species like your oak. So here we have a little red oak coming up. Um, over here, we have some hickories. Uh, both tiny seedlings making their way up to the surface to get that sunlight. And then we also see a lot of stump sprouts coming up out of the trees that were harvested. So even though that tree was taken, um, it still provides an opportunity for a new individual to grow in. Another species that will come in is this one right here. This is black locust. Um, and this is a species that really thrives in sunlight and these uh, shrubby conditions, these young forest conditions, this tree will not outlive your oaks. It'll grow for some time, die off, and fall out, uh, promoting more oak regeneration in the future as they get more sunlight. But in the meantime, while this sapling of black loc locust exists, it provides great foraging opportunity for the golden wing warbler. So here are some of those white oak seedlings that we've been hoping would come back in here. And this is why they're leaving a lot of white oak um, as a component of their mature leaf trees is in part to uh, encourage this regeneration. Um, oaks are also one of the trees that 
house the most insects, which of course is important for these insect eating birds. And so I'm really happy to see these oaks here. These ones are a stump sprout, but we saw some saplings over here. Quite a few. So seedlings here coming up from both from seed and from stump sprout here in our project area. So another species that benefits from this young forest habitat are pollinators, or more so a group of species. So there's a bumblebee on there, there was a small green bee on uh, these flowers over here as well. So these areas are super beneficial for pollinators. It gives them a great diversity of plants to forage on and help pollinate. Right above this wonderful pollinator um, species, we have an ailanthus or tree of heaven. So this is an invasive species native to China that causes problems in our ecosystems. Um, Kristen, does the program have any measures to deal with invasive species? They often come in after disturbances and logging and things. Yeah, so typically before and after a timber harvest we'll address invasive species either by mechanical means, chemical means, or a mix of mechanical and chemical means. So golden wing warblers will nest in that shrubland habitat with lots of saplings and blackberry. Um, and then once their fledglings leave the nest, they'll move through a variety of habitats, including something like this, like we see here, where it's much more forested, but you still see a lot of dense cover underneath. There's still some goldenrod growing in there, um, lots of young saplings. And what that does is help provide cover for the fledglings as they move around. Uh, it's pretty hard to move when you're only a few days old. So having extra cover and protection is really important for the species. So this is what that stand up there looked like before it was cut. You can see we have a lot of really nice oaks in here. There's some big white oaks, some big red oaks, some hickories, and tulip poplar. Um, and this stand looks very pleasing from a human standpoint. You can see through everything. Uh, it's nice shaded. There's good economic value in this timber. But from the perspective of wildlife, this isn't so great. Um, and that's because if you look on the forest floor, there's really nothing growing under here at all because of how much shade the forest floor is receiving from these big mature trees. So if you're a rabbit or a grouse, then you're trying to move from one place to the next and you just have this wide open forest floor, uh, it's going to be hard for you to travel because you're going to be easily spotted by predators. Whereas if you have some decent undergrowth, it's much more beneficial for cover and for food opportunities. So this is an area where instead of doing um, a very open canopy young forest habitat up there, uh, we did a little bit of a forest thinning here. So what this aims to do is create small gaps in the canopy to kind of help restart the forest, restart generation. And you can see that's working really well. In just this spot alone, we have a couple red oaks coming up, uh, some tiny white oak seedlings hanging in, a bunch of hickory seedlings and we still have species like black gum and sassafras and red maple coming up in here as well. So doing a forest thinning is a great way to help promote species diversity. Before you start doing any kind of forest uh, management, I highly recommend consulting with a forester, whether that be a private consulting forester or someone from Department of Forestry. They're going to be able to give you the best advice for your forest and your goals for your forest. Um, they may also be able to make a forest management plan for you, so uh, you have a long-term goal, a long-term timeline for how to manage your forest. So this is another example of really great golden wing warbler habitat. As you can see, we're standing amongst a power line here on the top of a ridge. Uh, and you still see those same plants we were looking at before in the timber harvest where we have some hickory saplings growing up here. Um, quite a lot of blackberry and raspberry tucked in underneath. Uh, in this area you also see a lot more forbs and grasses that are going to benefit those pollinators. Um, but overall this is still really great wildlife habitat and golden winged warbler habitat and something you can emulate on your own property. The more you can diversify your property to include different types of habitat, uh, the better you'll be serving wildlife, including the golden winged warbler. Thank you for joining me for 15 Minutes in the Forest with wildlife biologist Kristen Fuoco and learning about the golden-winged warbler. Please come back in two weeks for another 15 Minutes in the Forest.